Are we ready? Oh, there's your spotlight. Yeah. Well, good evening and welcome to section three of the Port Madison uh, Dialogues. I'm County Commissioner Ed Wolf, uh, and I'm honored to co moderate this evening with uh, Azure Bure. Azure, you're there out in the land somewhere. I'll wave to you. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to thank the participants for tuning in again this evening. This is for the third session of the Port Madison Dialogues. When we started this discussion format and content of dialogues, we had no idea of what we would experience, such as the overwhelming response, overwhelming response in the number of registrations and viewers. Overwhelming. I'm personally honored that the, the tribal leaders are, are so generous with their time and knowledge, engaging our community in a path of knowledge and understanding. I've always felt that our best path forward to me personally and all of us is to learn from others and together move forward together. I wouldn't be here this evening without our support and commitment of the Suquamish tribe and the Dispute Resolution Center of Kitsap County. Um, Azura, I think uh, you're on. All right, thank you. Welcome everybody. Uh, I am Azure Bore. I am the coordinator of the traditional food and medicine program here, um, as well as a tribal member. I would like to thank Commissioner Wolf for being part of the program today and Kitsap County's desire to be part of this, um, co-sponsoring this event. Um, thank you all who attended. I had no idea there would be so many participants either, and it's great. I absolutely love that. Um, such a resounding desire to attend and, and engage in this multi-part journey. Um, as a tribal member, I know firsthand of um, the how the tribe operates and some of the issues that are of most concern. Um, and they always have, there has not always been an understanding. And that's why this multi-part dialogue came to be. Um, to build a better understanding together as a community. Commissioner Wolf. So I would, um, first of all, the Kitsap County is is honored and uh, with Commissioner Gelder and Commissioner Burrito to be a part of this and this, this pretty amazing uh, event that's taking place at least the third time now and the fourth time. Uh, let me give a description, if I may, is there of, uh, uh, the, of the Port Madison Dialogues, and I promise I'll be brief on this. Mm -hmm. um, our understanding is built upon knowledge, and it's important that we have, uh, have, have some foundation understanding, I should say foundational understanding of the tribe. Uh, therefore, our four-part series. For those that were able to attend our, our last two sessions, we focused on pre-contact history, where and how the, the Suquamish people lived, Chief Seattle, uh, Chief Kitsap, the signing of the Treaty of Point Elliot, et cetera. In session two, we learn more about the tribe's works. Today in session three, we'll focus on some of the current issues facing the tribe, current issues facing the tribe today. And finally, the fourth session, and that is uh, November 4th. Uh, we'll be using a, a healing circle to share stories of the human side of the sometimes difficult relationships between native and non-native communities. Looking forward to this. Thank you. And as you said, tonight we are in session three, which focuses on some of the challenges the tribe faces today. These include protecting treaty fisheries, water quality and biodiversity, bias in education, policing and jurisdiction issues, crimes targeting Native women and children, vandalism and hate crimes, and building an economy that can support the tribal, the whole tribal community. Um, we have some panelists who will be discussing these topics, and we welcome your questions via the Q&A chat feature. Um, 
if similar to other sessions, we had a lot of um, great questions and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, but before we turn it over to our panelists, we have a song and some words from Kate Avakana, a tribal artist and a youth recreation worker with the tribe's friends and family center. Thank you. Welcome, Kate. Asla Hill, Azure. Um, Commissioner Ed Wolf, thank you so much. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, Kaika Blue Sitsta. My name is Kaika Blue, or um, my other name is Kate Avakana, and a lot of people call me that. Um, I am a Suquamish tribal member, and I work for the Suquamish tribe. I also um, volunteer a lot of time with cultural um, events and community, and um, I do a lot of art as well, um, a lot of tribal art. So I just want to say thank you for everyone being here tonight. Um, I was asked to come and sing an opening song, um, and I was also asked to talk a little bit about songs and what they are. Um, for us, traditionally, what I was told is that songs are intellectual property, and they, own, they are owned by a person, a family, a tribe, or a group of larger tribal members um, or intertribal. Um, and I was told that they are alive. So each song that is owned or used is something that has this tangible spirit to it. And it, each one has its own purpose. Um, and we talk a lot about what those purposes are and use them in an appropriate way still to this day. Um, songs, because they are property, um, we share them with each other and they can be given as gifts. Um, and they can be used to bring people together, to heal people, to create a space for prayer, to create a space for conversations like we're gonna be having tonight. Um, and they can be used to start and end things so that we know that when you walk into that space that you should have a clear mind of what you're doing, um, to have a clear focus and purpose. So songs are really important to a lot of people, um, indigenous people in general. And I think they're really important to Suquamish and I'm very honored and humbled to be asked to do this tonight. So um, thank you. Um, I'm gonna be singing a song that my mother caught, um, the gathering song. This is owned by all of Suquamish people. Um, and this is to gather people, to let people know that important work is gonna be happening and that Suquamish should gather. <clears throat> you're on you're on mute it i'm very bad at that after two years you think i do better than uh, kate i'm i'm totally i'm encapsulated in, in 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 your song and your reference to your mother i want to say that before i went to my prepared script so 
Um, thank you. Wonderful song. It's, it creates a space for the, the evening program. You've created the space for the evening program. It's my honor to introduce our panelists now. Um, we're thrilled to have two members of the Skarmish Tribal Council with us, uh, Robin Littlewing Saigo uh, will be up here, and Luther J. Ambassador Miles uh, is there also, along with uh, Jamie Goodby, Director of Human Resources for the tribe, and, and I believe also acting co executive director of the Suquamish tribe, all of those things. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this evening's program. Yes, thank you panel for being here. I'm just honored that you guys let me come on here with you and share the space. And I'm really hoping to hear some really good discussions. On, um, so we're asking anybody to put questions into the Q&A chat box. Um, Let's see, don't have any questions yet. <laughs> Would you guys like to, um, oh, slideshow. There we go. All right, my name is Robin Littlewing Saigo. I am the treasurer on the Suquamish Tribal Council and mom to four awesome kids and I'm super, um, excited to be here. Um, I've gotten to jump in on a couple of these and, you know, I'm already teared up as Kate was singing and talking about her mom and the gathering song is so special to us. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges that um, have faced our people uh, during, you know, especially more recent times. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that, um, it, it wasn't until 1978, within my lifetime, that it was before 1978, it was illegal for that song to have been sung in public. Um, that was when the Native American Religious Freedom Act was, um, was passed. And so when we talk about this history um, for the tribe, we're not talking about very long. When we're going to talk about boarding schools, we're only talking, you know, my grandma went to boarding school. That's not very long ago. That's only two generations ago. Um, none of us would have had the pleasure of hearing um, Kate sing that song. And so her mom as a song catcher and Kate as a song catcher, um, learning that song and sharing it with us as a tribe is is really powerful, more powerful, I think, than, um, than I can really explain. But if we could kind of sit with that and recognize that the history that we're going to be talking about, because you got to hear our creation story since time immemorial, and now we're gonna talk about some more recent history that's really powerful. And so Kate starting us off in a good way with a song and that medicine that it provides for us, that medicine wasn't available to us in a legal way until 1978. So it's not very old. And that's the place that we're coming from today. We recognize that these can be hard conversations to have. They're gonna be hard for us. We're gonna make sure that we do the things that we need to do to keep our souls in a really good place. I'm gonna drink some nice warm tea out of my Suquamish Love cup. Um, and I hope my fellow panelists and moderators will take some time tonight to really hold space for themselves since this um, can be a tough conversation. Um, we are looking here, we put together some slides for you. A lot of them are photos because a lot, we want to really make this as personal as possible. And I think that, you know, you have those photos that you just get to connect with and having our archives here at the Suquamish Museum is a really powerful part of where we are. It's really nice to have them here at the center. I can see the museum from where I am right now. I'm just kitty corner to it. And a lot of our sacred things are kept right there. So being able to be close to those feels really good in this space. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about land and territory to start. We're going to start in this um, way of recognizing. We've talked about some of the history around that, the different areas that Suquamish is um, growing, and recognizing that here where we are in the town of Suquamish is not the only place. That's just our reservation. Um, Azure and Jay and Jamie and I, all our families come from out in Chico and the Finney Bay area. And um, I'm not sure who's doing the slides, but if we can move forward one. And I'm gonna try not to get too distracted by those photos as well. But I really would like um, for you to all see these beautiful places that we live, the waters that we live, that there's the piece where you see your kids on the beach and you recognize that since time immemorial, your family has been there, that they have played on that beach, your ancestors have played on that beach. And so getting to see some of these images side by side, these strong ancestors, these strong future ancestors. Next. The Suquamish Reservation is, um, is very small and it's a checkerboard reservation, which is different than a lot of reservations you'll find. So the checkerboard reservation means that we have the boundaries within there, um, but non-native people can own some of that land. And because we've had, you know, I mean, my friend Nigel always says, our ancestors were so wise, they, they landed us here in the center of our universe that is the most beautiful area in the world. And you know, as I saw the leaves flying all over the place today and, this, and the waves crashing out in the water, you know, it's really true. And so we really build and gain our strength from this land, but it's much smaller than it was. And looking at the different ways that the land was taken from us, next. So we're gonna work really hard to buy back our land and we're gonna talk about some of these. We really work to um, house and educate our tribal members. Uh, recovering from trauma has been something that we've worked on nonstop and um, protecting our marine ecosystems the way we used to and continued um, ways to do that. We're gonna hear from Jay about that, a longtime fisherman who uh, fished with my dad and, um, and he's also gonna talk about um, building up our economy. Jay was our very first Port Madison Enterprises employee when he was 16 years old. And I can't wait to hear, I always love hearing um, his stories. And then we're gonna talk about um, some of the different ways we've been rebuilding and we're gonna hear from Jamie Gooby on that. And um, then how we've deal dealt with continued racism and violence and different ways that you can be allies to help us through that. Next. So when you look at what our territory is, and sometimes you'll hear the term uh, UNA, which is the usual and a custom area. And I'm probably gonna let Jay talk more about that when he gets um, to his part. So then you can see those tiny parcels there. I'm pointing at the screen and it's coming up. Uh, you can see those tiny parcels. And when we first, um, when we first, um, got confined to a reservation. It was just that smaller parcel here in Suquamish. It wasn't until later that we were able to um, add that other piece in there, that Indianola piece. So we have two separate ones. You can't get there, you can't get to one part of our reservation without crossing into non-reservation area. All right, next. And if you look at some of these things, you can see how it was definitely used as tourism. And we, and we certainly still get tourism here today. And fortunately, ones that we get to, um, you know, tell the truthful narrative about. But when you look at the areas where um, Chief Seattle's, um, Chief Seattle Park was, that's where Old Man um, House was, which was the longest documented um, longhouse um, in this area. And you can see that it says Chief Seattle Park over here and you know, this is real living. And you know, it was definitely a summer kind of community for people. And so all these people have this beautiful waterfront land and really that land is, um, 
is a land that was really sad, that was taken from us. There's a lot of sad stories there. There's a lot of trauma associated with that. One of the things we've recently gotten back in our um, archives is a piece from um, the Kitsap County Historical Society, which is the only remaining um, wood plank from Old Man House. And I fortunately got to see it a couple of weeks ago and was nearly in tears just feeling like all of the things that that, that piece saw, the good times and the kids playing and the sounds of new babies and um, the sounds of stories from our ancestors and getting to hear Lachutzi all the time. And so much was coming from that. And then all the loss that happened as well. Which really brings us into some of the trauma pieces that we have been working on. My background is as a mental health counselor. I have a master's degree in social work and I specifically went into school after an undergraduate in anthropology to really study how to heal from trauma and recognizing different ways that we did that within our tribe uh, naturally and getting those ones to um, be recognized as best practices um, so that we could fund different things. We also were able to utilize money from our casino and economic endeavors to put money immediately towards healthcare and um, health and wellness. Next slide, please. Because when we're talking about sending kids to um, boarding schools, we're talking about sending them to a place where they were disconnected from all that they had known in a way to really, um, I believe the saying was, um, kill the Indian, save the man. And that, that process was, was very successful in a lot of ways. Fortunately, not completely successful. We held on to those, but, but the grandparents and great grandparents and parents that came back from there really had to sit with a lot of very hard emotions and to put those away. And that did um, result in um, addictions, alcoholism, um, detached levels of parenting because they hadn't learned how to do those things, detached feelings from different, from the community as well, not knowing who to ask for, for help, not wanting to talk about the awful uh, atrocities that had happened to them because they wanted to protect other people from that. So when we look at doing at things, and next slide, please. When we look at what's next is we look at those, those places where we can build on those strengths. That's a natural tendency for us as a community because we look for each person to really um, connect with somebody else. So recently, um, a friend of mine was telling me about some research she was doing about trauma and about communities and the smallest divisible uh, piece of a community isn't the individual. The smallest is connections, family connections, because it within that family, you need those. As humans, we need those connections. And this was a way to separate those connections on all fronts. So how do you rebuild that? And you rebuild that by telling some of those stories, by making spaces to make things, to make each other smile. And we often talk about res humor and res is one of our words for a reservation. And we find things to laugh about even in the hardest times. And there are stories of so many parents who, um, and siblings who would do things to protect the younger ones. And part of it was just laughing. We have a game called Come Forth Laughing that was taught to us by our ancestors. And, you can hear about that at our Suquamish Museum, but really looking for ways to connect and separate and find joyful moments, even in the harshest conditions. Next, please. The experience of being um, taken away to boarding schools was also compounded by um, what they called sweeps. They would take children uh, from, they would, the same way they took land from us, they would declare parents and adults uh, incompetent to pay their taxes, to keep up with their land and to take care of their kids. 
And so they started to adopt those kids out. They would just take them away for any number of things. The records are really heartbreaking to see. And um, so we really worked really hard to do the Indian Child Welfare Act. It continues to be under threat. And um, we followed this carefully. I myself sit on the um, National Indian Child Welfare Association. I am a foster mom and, um, you know, it, it always feels strange to say foster mom because in our communities, it's really just aunties and uncles and cousins and grandparents who take care of kids. Like that's just, that's just what happens. And, and it feels really good. And although after 18 years of being a foster parent and sometimes having DSHS say, oh, you'll, well, you're a relative placement. And then six months later when they meet with me, and they say, oh, no, actually, you're not close enough related. Your second cousin's once removed, and that's not really a relative. So actually, you're a foster parent. And, you know, I, at some point, I was just like, you know, you guys can define it however you need to. I'm going to care and love for their, my child the best way that I can, whether she's my cousin or my daughter, because really, she's both of those things. Next. We've really made an education a priority. Um, when I went to school, I was uh, one of three tribal members who were going to college at that time. And having grown up with my dad in the museum, in the building or Suquamish Museum, uh, he and my mom both worked on oral history projects with uh, Marilyn Jones and Barbara Lawrence and Leonard Forsman and Peg Deem. We, um, we got to be around all those things. And that's where I got to gain a lot of strength and the ability to think about how do I survive outside of this reservation? Because it's a scary place to go. I mean, I can remember, you know, being at Denny's when I was a kid and not being seated because my dad had long hair and was clearly an Indian and, you know, going clam digging and people would, um, you know, light fireworks or something. And I would think that they were gun, like bullets being shot out there. They would yell horrible things at us for exercising um, something that are exercising our sovereignty, um, gathering food, like that food was coming home with us, you know, to eat, to celebrate. And those things really happened. And so when we look at, and of course, when it comes to treaties, there wasn't enough, there's, there was never enough money. We had to come up with that money on, on our own. And that was one of the things Jay will talk about later and, and our history with that. And um, next, please, next slide. When I came back from college for my undergrad, um, I was 22 and uh, Jamie Gooby and I started on the same day. And we, um, you know, our plan was just to work here for a little while and then we would, you know, move to Seattle or move somewhere else to do something. And, you know, here we are 23 years later, half of my life. And I'd started writing grants and helping with a couple of things like that. And what I noticed, one of my questions was, um, why is our elder, why do elders start at 55 when other elder programs start at 65? And I was told that um, we worked with the federal government to have that age lowered because we didn't have elders that were living to be 65. The, with the amount of trauma, the lack of access to health care meant that we just were not living that long. And so as I was writing grants, I started talking about that progress. And we, um, once we start getting money from our bingo hall and things like that, that money early on went towards a couple things. One was to buy back land. One was to help with our fishing and um, hunting areas. And the other was for healthcare. We worked really hard to get new healthcare options and expand what was available to that. And I'm, you know, that one was one of the things that was so important to us and also education. And so we really, we have a really wonderful wellness program. It um, is a behavioral health program. And that's Azure and I started working there so long ago doing charting. And, you know, we've ended up in so many different places at that point. 
Um, but I remember hearing the stories of it being started and the first one was a referral program for substance abuse and it was in the copy area at our old tribal center. There was no confidentiality about it. You were just, because that was the only spot that was available or that somebody else would use the copy room to do mental health counseling. Um, but it was always a priority. It was always, how can we help? How can we get you the services you need? And, and that's worked really well. We go, we've gotten to see that bloom into things like the Suquamish uh, traditional food and medicine program, uh, which Azure heads up over there and um, the healing of the canoe program, which I got to work on for quite some time. All right, next please. Um, we have a beautiful health and fitness center alongside of our, um, our family and friends center, our youth center right there. It's an amazing process to see it come through to figure out, you know, how to feel comfortable in our bodies. Again, a lot of times when we're talking about um, the abuses that happened in boarding schools and subsequently in homes um, from repeating some of that behavior is that you don't feel centered in your own body. You don't feel safe in your own body. And that process of reconnecting, and I like to refer to it as body sovereignty. When you get to control what happens to your body instead of somebody forcing their will over you, um, means that you get to um, experience a new type of freedom. And um, one of our tribal council members, Sammy Mabe, runs the fitness center and, um, you know, really enjoys doing that. We have a great elders walking program. Um, we've had our wellness center that transitioned really quickly to online support systems during the pandemic. And um, it's been really wonderful to see that, to see those connections that have come up um, during the pandemic where our, our tribe wants to gather so much that we just had increased uses in like all of the, Azure started doing traditional plant um, classes online our Lashuti language program, and they've had even more people involved, our tribal council meeting and budget hearings. We have so many more people involved now that it's online and it's been really wonderful. Next slide, please. And I am going to turn some of this over to um, council member Jay Mills and um, take it away, Jay. Oh, thank you, Robin. Um, you know, uh, like you say, hearing, you know, some of your experiences, you know, because I know you and you and my daughter grew up together in this neighborhood that we lived in, and I'm still living in. And um, this is just great to hear your experience. Um, you know, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Luther um, Mills Jr. Um, I've worked um, for the tribe for going on 43 years now. Um, so I've seen um, a lot of the changes, um, you know, uh, in the tribe and the tribal government. Uh, I've been honored to be elected to tribal council um, almost 20 plus 20 some years. Um, and so to be a part of uh, a lot of the growth um, and as well. Um, but as you know, there's, you know, just so much going on in this world. And, you know, um, to try to give you a firsthand experience, um, of how these things have changed, um, you know, our way of, of, of living. Um, and some of the things that, you know, uh, my great grandmother had taught me and my great uncle, um, you know, growing up in Bremerton, Finney Bay, um, you know, um, you know, we're, we were talking about this climate change, you know, the climate change is real, you know, people may not think so, but you know, the way it, it, it's changing the environment, um, you know, um, you know, our fishing industry, you know, um, you know, when you, you try to go fish and there's no fish to catch, you know, um, uh, you know, the ocean, uh, ocean acidification, you know, um, you know, where the, the shells are just kind of dwindling and, and falling apart. And, and um, you know, uh, I know that we had uh, some students, some, some of our, our tribal um, CKA students, there was four of them that got to go back to Washington, D.C., um, they had been working with our one of our biologists, um, you know, and trying to determine what the heck is going on with the ocean acidification. And they were fortunate enough to be able to go back to DC and testify. 
you know, um, about, you know, um, the ocean acidification. And I couldn't have been more proud of, um, of, of them giving that testimony. Um, and just recently in February, our chairman, along with, um, I think the, um, you know, uh, chairperson, um, you know, was able to, to testify in front of the Senate, uh, I think in the, just this last February. So the tribes are, are, are very much involved in, in um, you know, trying to get the message across uh, um, and trying to get some help um, in, you know, getting these um, things in, in order. Um, I think the endangered, um, you know, I know our, our chairman also was uh, um, appointed to a task force on the, the endangered marine life, the orcas. Um, I know he takes that serious. Um, and you know, um, these orcas are, are, are dying off. They don't have the food. They don't have, they, they rely heavily on the Chinook salmon. And, um, you know, uh, as you know, all these, um, you know, these fisheries seem to be dwindling. Um, so next slide. I think it's in there somewhere. Here, um, you know, some of the threats, um, you know, to the salmon and the other traditional foods is, um, you know, um, just the, um, you know, protecting our treaty rights. You know, treaty rights were guaranteed us the right to, um, to harvest um, and fish in our usual and custom areas. I mean, that was a guarantee, you know, the law of the land. Um, but as you know, with, you know, the climate changes and, you know, the, the um, you know, the changes in the environment that are, are killing off the salmon, you know, um, you know, I always say that, you know, we've been guaranteed, you know, in, in 1974, the Bolt decision guaranteed the rights to harvest 50% um, of the, um, the harvestable fish in, in the Washington state. Well, you know, the, at the rate it's going, you know, 50% of nothing is nothing. You know, if we don't start doing something now to, to make a change, you know, and then you say, well, what can we do? I mean, you look around, you just look at the environment. You look at all the development on the beaches, on the shores, you know, the docks and buoys that are putting in, the boats that are being orged, the sewage spills, you know, um, you know, the runoff, you know, um, you know, I, I know that recently there was an article printed out and I think our fisheries uh, um, hatchery had a little bit to do with, they couldn't figure out why the coho salmon, the smolts um, were, once they were released, they would just die up. They just turn over and, and belly up and, and they were doing more and more research with the University of Washington. And, and they just printed out a report that they finally, you know, um, were trying to figure out what the trigger was and, um, they had done their research and the scientists and, and, and everyone was working on it. And they determined it, it was the wear of tires, uh, certain tires, the, the wear on the tire would be the runoff that would run into the creeks and streams and was, was causing uh, these salmon to die. You know? So you know, just finding out and learning about that is, is hopefully we can make that change and, and maybe you know, get rid of that, um, that substance that they're using in those tires because you know, vehicles are gonna be on the road um, we just need to adapt and, and, and know that this is what's causing some of the issues and let's try to fix it. Um, next slide. You know, when Robin was talking about the reservation, um, you know, the, the, the reservation is approximately uh, 7,600 7, acres, you know, of which the tribal government um, uh, owns about maybe 1,500 acres. Individual tribal members with their allotments own about 2,600 acres. And uh, non-tribal ownership is um, over 30, uh, 3,500 acres. You know, so it was a, a real big focus that, you know, with the, some of the proceeds that, you know, we had, we had gotten from our, our enterprises that land acquisition was gonna be a high priority. Um, Protecting the salmon, the orcas, and the shellfish. Again, going back to the treaty rights. Um, you know, I think if if people understood what the treaty rights are, you know, um, they're the supreme law of the land. It states, states it right in the in the treaty. Um, 
that they'd understand how or, or why the tribes and uh, our membership um, are working so hard in order to preserve, um, you know, those um, those rights. Um, uh, the culvert case. Um, I don't know if people understand what that that case was, but the tribes had sued the state of Washington for, you know, these culverts that were placed in and blocked a passage so the salmon couldn't get up and spawn. And so this went to the, the state Supreme Court and it was appealed all the way to the United States Supreme Court. You know, I was honored because I got the opportunity to go back to Washington, D.C., to the highest court in the nation and, and listen to that case. Um, I know I had an experience in that in that courtroom that, um, you know, I'll share with you is that I I had wore this beautiful um, Tlingit um, a vest that I had got on an elder on an Alaska trip. And I was I was just honored. I was, you know, I was styling um, <laughs> and I'm sitting in the back of the courtroom and I have this uh, U.S. Marshal come up and ask. He said he wanted to speak to me. And so we got up and we went back to the back to the court in the courtroom and and he goes well tell me about the vest and I go well I thought he was admiring it <laughs> so I go well, it's got you know mother pearl buttons around it and it's all beaded around here and he goes well you know um we're trying to keep the courtroom impartial um you may be asked to um to cover it up or remove it and and he and he left I, I sat down and about five minutes later he comes back and he says yeah if you could if you could take it off or cover it up, that'd be great. So, you know, I took off my vest, I folded it up and I put it in my lap. Um, he left, um, he come back five minutes later and he escorted me outside the court chambers in, in to the U.S. Marshal's office and had me turn over my vest. <clears throat> These are things that, you know, are happening. This has happened in, in 2018, um, they're real. I didn't wear that vest to make any kind of protest. I thought I, you know, I thought it was, you know, I was representing the tribe and I was proud to be a representative and uh, how that made me feel and how, think about how that would make you feel, you know, but these things are still happening uh, to this day. Um, you know, the tri you know, that's just, you know, I, 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 one of the struggles. I'm happy to say that, you know, the tribes had, uh, had won the court case and the state is, you know, liable to to get these culverts replaced, um, and they have to the year 2030 to do it. So, um, you know, I think that that's that's great. So, what's happened to me? You know, just a little part. Um, you know, I'm just glad that that um, that court case went in the tribe's favor. And it's not only the tribe's favor; it's in, in everyone's favor. You know, because if those fish passages get opened up, you know, there's more likelihood that you know more fish will spawn. You know. And can you speak um, yeah. to the, can you speak to not only the importance of that, um, this food is our medicine and also our livelihood. So is there anything you want to talk to that speaks to uh, this as a priority for us, for how we feed our families and, and how we use it for our spiritual Well, I, I think exactly, again, getting back to protecting those, those, those treaty rights is, you know, um, you know, you, I think people look at the, the Puget Sound or the Salish Sea as maybe more of a recreation. You know, we look at it more of a, a food source, you know, with the, the salmon, the crab, you know, the shrimp, the halibut, you know, the rock, rockfish, you know, um, the gooey deck. Um, those are things that, you know, I grew up on, you know, um, and I think that those are things that we want to protect for future generations. But they won't be there if we continue to allow sewage spills um, that contaminate the beaches and close them down. Um, the stormwater runoff, if it's not treated to uh, some point, um, you know, because um, you're always going to have, you know, um, stormwater running into, um, you know, our, our little um, pristine Puget Sound area. Um, you know, um, so. You know, growing up and um, living off, um, you know, the, the sea, you know, it'd be nothing for you to go down and dig a bucket of clams and bring it up for dinner. You know, I can't tell you that, you know, now that there's a McDonald's or Burger King on every corner, you know, um, you know, we need to get back, you know, to those uh, traditional foods. Um, and uh, one way to do it is to, to protect our environment. So next slide.
Okay. Um, talking about the economy, um, you know, um, you know, again, I, I guess I'm happy to say that, you know, I was the first PME employee. I had worked probably about 10 years before PME was, um, was, um, you know, uh, I guess, um, established. Um, now, Port Madison Enterprise, um, I guess a little bit of history on it. It was established because, you know, the tribe um, as a sovereign had a hard time acquiring loans from banks because um, the banks didn't feel like if the tribe defaulted that they would be able to, um, we would be able to secure those loans. And so um, what we had done was we established a, a business arm, uh, the Port Madison Enterprise, and we had appointed seven members uh, to this board. Now, what they were able to do was um, they were able to sign a, a you know, um, a, a waiver of, you know, a, a limited waiver of sovereign immunity to acquire loans to start businesses, you know. So, you know, prior to the PME board, you know, our first business, uh, I, I think, was established in, in 1974, which was a smoke shop. Um, I started working in 1977. Um, you know, the tribal, the tribe um, was forced to close down uh, that the smoke shop because the state felt that um, us selling um, cigarettes with a tribal tax, which was so much less than a state tax, um, um, was they, they took us to court and they'd won. Um, after the cigarettes, we opened up a liquor store and we basically kind of did the same thing. We, we bought the liquor, put a tribal tax on it and we're, we're selling that. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> shortly, um, I think we, we opened a liquor store in, in 1981. And I think what happened there was, um, you know, uh, we would literally have, you know, state liquor agents sitting outside the, the tribal liquor store and would pull over customers that had left the store. And so, um, you know, I, I recall a van pulling up, you know, across the street and um, and a person, um, you know, our, our, had our chairman, who wasn't our chairman at the time, but he ran over to, to, to find out um, if it was any state agents. And he heard people rushing, you know, moving around inside this van. Um, but that's, those are some of the struggles that, you know, the tribe or that we experienced. Um, and that's just trying to practice our sovereign right to do business. Um, and we, we just continue to have these battles, you know. So after... The liquor store, we ended up getting into gaming and we started out with bingo, I believe in probably 1992. Um, you know, I, I think I transitioned to bingo probably um, at about 95 um, and went down and worked as an assistant bingo manager. But, you know, this bingo operation, you know, um, you know, kind of grew. Um, we got into the electronic machines. Uh, prior to that, we got into table games and then the electronic machines. Um, and then basically that just, you know, kind of grew and we were able to, you know, acquire money. To, and, you know, at this time, banks were lining up to loan tribes money, um, which was quite different. So next slide. So this is what I refer to as um, the old Twinkie it's a sprung structure. Um, basically, this had, um, you know, our... Um, probably about uh, 30 table games, um, probably about um, 300 um, electronic gaming devices. Uh, next slide. And this is what, um, you know, we've built. Um, it's one of the most beautiful casinos, resorts, um, I think uh, in the state of Washington. Um, and it's something that we're very proud of. You know, I can remember, um, you know, going with a fellow um, tribal uh, council member, Rich Purser, um, where we went over to an auction to acquire the property, the 14 acres of property that went up for a tax sale. And so Rich Purser, our treasurer, uh, Leota Anthony and myself went over to the steps of Port Orchard and, uh, and start bidding on this property. And we didn't have a whole lot of money in the bank, <laughs> but um, we were we were able to to acquire it, and I think it ended up being about seventy two thousand uh, dollars for fourteen acres. <laughs> and Jay, Next if slide. I remember correctly, we only had about seventy four thousand dollars. Yes, in the bank. you are you are that <laughs> is true. 
That is true. So it was really an all or nothing kind of situation. We were, yep. Next slide. So this is, um, you know, uh, part of the new um, wing uh, of the casino. Um, you know, it's, it's called the tower and this is one of the banquet rooms. Um, next slide. You know, I worked down at Cayenne Lodge. So I wasn't real happy when they built this banquet room. <laughs> but here is, um, you know, another uh, business that we had acquired was uh, White Horse Golf Course. You know, this golf course was under distress and, and um, you know, they were trying to keep, keep it open as long as they could. And, you know, I remember talking to some of the management and, and just their struggles um, that they had trying to um, you know, acquire fertilizer and, and machines to keep up the course. And, you know, um, you know, and they weren't real sure what would happen when the tribe took over, but I can almost guarantee you that they are elated um, that they were able to get the equipment um, needed to maintain the golf course, um, get the clubhouse, you know, from a trailer to this beautiful clubhouse. And again, um, it's just one of the, I think the top 10 maybe golf courses in the state of Washington. And, um, you know, very proud of, proud of that property. Next slide. Actually, we closed that deal on February, I think 23rd of, you know, I forget the year, but that was my birthday. I said, I got a golf course for my birthday. <laughs> Um, this is um, Suquamish Seafoods. It's one of the other uh, tribal government um, uh, businesses. This isn't uh, managed by Port Madison Enterprises. But um, the Suquamish Seafood started out uh, with just selling a gooey duck to China. And, you know, we, we've had um, divers diving for gooey duck for probably close to 20 years now. And, um, you know, just, you know, some of the struggles, you um, with the, 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 the Trump administration, with the tariffs, you know, that were imposed, uh, really put a damper on business. Um, and then, of course, we had the PSB um, where um, they thought that the gooey ducks were contaminated and China quit buying um, gooey duck from Washington State, um, you know, um, and, and now um, we're just slowly trying to, to rebuild um, that enterprise um, but, uh, and, and, and expand it. I think uh, we just recently opened up a retail outlet where you can you know, buy crab and gooey duck and clams and, and um, really fresh product uh, that um, you know, our fishermen are, are bringing in. Um, this boat, um, um, the, the marine vessel carrier, um, this is Jeff Carrier, one of our tribal members. Um, who unfortunately suffered, you know, a, a stroke um, while he was out uh, on the boat. And um, so he's um, disabled now. Um, and we had this new boat built by a grant that the tribe had got. And um, the, the uh, divers and uh, management felt that uh, it would be appropriate to name this boat after uh, Mr. Carrier. Um, and when he seen his name on that boat, <laughs> he was very, very proud. You know, so next slide. Okay, these are some of the enterprises. Um, you know, the Port Madison retail, that's kind of like, I guess, where I started out the smoke shop, you know, in 77. Cayenne Lodge, I managed that property um, for about 15 years. Um, we have um, Agate Dreams, which is, I think, Suquamish Evergreen Corporation now. And then um, uh, PME Construction um, Company who we were just, you know, really proud of the fact that we just acquired a, uh, I think a $9.2 million contract, um, you know, I think it was last year or the year before. So um, I'm pretty proud of that. Next slide. Um, the uh, contributions, um, you know, I got a little bit more information on um, just exactly what um, the tribe has contributed um, 
you know, over the years. And, you know, um, the tribal government, along with PME, the uh, economic contribution, you know, to, up to date in 2021 was 88 million, 88.6 million dollars. Um, that was in wages and um, uh, paid to our employees. Um, in goods and services, um, $113 million um, the goods and services purchased um, through our enterprises. And then um, spent on capital uh, expenditures was about $21.4 million. And um, again, I think um, Jamie will talk a little bit more about um, some of the uh, um, um, capital expenditures that the tribe has been involved with. Um, next slide. And I am going to turn it over to uh, Jamie Gooby, uh, someone I am very, very proud of. Um, she happens to be my daughter. Uh, she's been the HR director um, for how many years? 23 years. 23 years. And she has uh, been um, a co-executive director for almost a year and a half now, I believe. And so, Jamie, take it away. Thank you so much, Mr. Mills. It is a pleasure to be here um, to talk about, you know, the buildings and the economic development of the tribe. Um, it, you know, we have been thriving amongst all of these challenges that we've talked about tonight and that have come before us. You know, we've just been really fortunate that the combination of the revenue from our tribal enterprises, such as the Clearwater Casino Resort and revenues from the Suquamish Foundation and other various federal, state, and county funded projects and private grant funders have given us, you know, a real ability to create opportunity here on the Port Madison Indian Reservation. And it's helped us develop a lot of infrastructure. So, you know, on this slide, you're seeing pictures of our Marion Forsman Boucher Early Learning Center, our House of Awaken Culture, and the Suquamish Dock. And the priorities for the development and expansion um, of these buildings, you know, really focus on the tribe's vision and mission to provide for the health, education, and welfare of our families, reflecting our tr traditional Suquamish values. Um, you know, we've been really committed to providing a strong foundational early education um, for our community. And the Marion Forsman Boucher Early Learning Center is a great example of that commitment to provide, you know, culturally appropriate child care, early Head Start and Head Start programs, and parent caregiver involvement programs for our community, including Lachutzi language. Uh, the Early Learning Center is um, named in honor and memory of the late Marion Forsman Boucher, who is the sister of our tribal chairman, Leonard Forsman. And Marion was a true advocate for education, and she dedicated her, herself and her career, uh, both professionally and personally, to ensure that every tribal member would have the opportunity to thrive in an educational setting. And the tribe's partnership with the Gates Foundation made the building of the Marion Forsman Boucher Early Learning Center facility possible. Um, in the heart of Suquamish, you will find our House of Awakened Culture, uh, which is the longhouse uh, picture that you see on the screen, um, and also the Veterans Memorial and Chief Seattle Grave Site. Next slide. These two, uh, Memorial and the grave site uh, and the Suquamish Dock, which was in the last slide, is located uh, in close vicinity to our Puget Sound waters. The creation of the House of Awakened Culture was built to honor the former home of uh, Suquamish Chief Seattle and Chief Kitsap and really signified a uh, cultural resurgence in Suquamish. Um, our longhouse, um, like Robin had mentioned before, which we had is known as the Old Man House, which was burned down by federal agents, you know, after Seattle's death in 1870. Um, it is just, you know, one of the things that that demonstrates the importance of having a gathering place. Um, all of these things that you see built here are close to our waters in the heart of Suquamish. Um, and in these places gather thousands of vis visitors, you know, year by year. Um, for Chief Seattle Days, we have uh, the Chief Seattle Graveside honoring in August, and we also have our canoe hostings, which are located in downtown Suquamish, and a lot of our ceremonial um, traditions we carry on in that House of Awakened culture. 
Next slide. The Suquamish Museum and Cultural Center uh, is a great building just adjacent to the Suquamish Tribe Administration Complex. Uh, we have recently built a community park next to the Suquamish Museum. If you ever have a chance to go there, you could bring your kids and, and it's a great um, park that Robin can probably speak a little bit more to. Um, next slide. Uh, Love to show you our Suquamish Seafoods Building, our Fitness Center, and our Family and Friends Center, which are representative of our tribe's uh, core values. You know, practicing, learning, teaching, evolving our culture, and living off of our traditional foods. You know, like Jay Mills mentioned, you know, using our treaty rights to harvest, um, providing opportunities that enhance our health and welfare of our tribe. Um, this is what the Suquamish Seafoods Building and the Family and Friends Center does for our families. Um, it gives us that important connection to our past, and um, we're so grateful. And in all of these buildings, you know, we incorporate all of our culture into these spaces. You know, we, we take into consideration sustainable building design, uh, native landscaping, and we make sure to find a way that we connect these spaces together um, in a place that really protects our culture um, and is something that is beautiful that we can share with everyone else. Um, I think that our most important value that we hold as Suquamish people is really building that sense of community. And I think that that's really represented here um, on the Port Madison Indian Reservation. One of our current projects that we are working on now is the development of a small health clinic which will be located on Suquamish Way, just adjacent to the Suquamish Museum, in between our administrative building complex and the downtown waterfront. Um, this will definitely fill an immediate need for us to allow us to continue to respond effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which, you know, public health crisis, um, while we develop a larger health center um, in the future. The clinic will allow the tribe to expand our healthcare access for our members and patients who are unable to obtain primary care due to the overburden on our existing healthcare delivery systems in this uh, local area. Uh, we will include a naturopath on that clinical team, which is really exciting, and work with our traditional foods and medicine program with Azure. Um, as a component of our culturally responsive care. So you can just see that there's been a lot of thought put into our infrastructure here on the tribe and finding a way that we can um, provide services here uh, for our membership and a way that we can thrive. Next slide. All right, thank you so much, Jamie, for all of that. Uh, we see so many beautiful things that we have done here. And um, we're gonna talk about um, racism and some of the ways those things look and some of the ways they show up. And one of those um, ways is that um, for a lot of us, we grew up um, having people not wanna live here, not wanna buy houses in Suquamish. It was actually a relatively inexpensive place to buy a house for a long time because uh, people didn't wanna live on the res. They were like, the assumption was that there were going to be run down houses, run down cars, that there would be a lot of crime and violence and, um, and that somehow we brought that with us. And that, um, and you know, when we talk about things like old man house getting burnt down, and kids taken away, you're suddenly like, well, wait a second, who's, who's causing the violence? Where do, where do those things come from? And um, as, you know, anytime we start making anything, um, there's always um, white people, honestly, that come and tell us different ways where we should spend our money and how we should do it. And, you know, we didn't touch on too much on the lease land that we had here that we were accused of you know, kicking elders or old non-native elders out of their houses when really they bought that land knowing that it was a lease and that we didn't get very much money from it, but we had to lease out that land because we needed support. We needed our council members in the 1950s and 60s to be able to fly back to DC to fight for 
us to get our land, to fight to make sure that our treaty rights were being taken care of. Um, I saw a question in the chat where they asked about um, what was said inside the treaty and they talked directly about healthcare and it says we recently looked at it and it says that the federal government would provide a doctor as well as vaccines. And we thought that that was a really great one um, to think about because I know that for me and like for Jamie's mom, um, our moms were very much like, you need to get vaccinated. You're going to your WIC appointment, your women and infant child appointment and getting all of your vaccines that you could get there and go to the doctor to do all those things. Because our ancestors talked about losing so many people to things like smallpox. So mm -hmm. we were early adopters of vaccine and of sciences and um, continue to be throughout this pandemic. But one of the things that has come from us rebuilding this land is, um, you know, I said that lots of people had ideas on the way we should do it. We open up a lot of parks that are public park, that they're tribal parks. And I, there is an assumption by people here, non-Native people who live here on the reservation, that those are public lands for them. But those are tribal lands that we choose to invite people to. So when we have them closed down, we have a beautiful playground that completed construction right as the pandemic um, was getting started. And for people who've driven by it, you can see these big orca whales that are there. And, you know, I would get calls from my sister and she'd put my nephew on the phone saying, I want to go play in the park. I want to go play in the park. And lots of kids had that feeling. And, but we closed it and we kept it closed because uh, we didn't know if COVID was being spread while outside. And we, you know, we had so many people, non-Native people, who would go into the park when we weren't there. And they were upset when we asked for a weekend where it was just tribal families. And somebody likened it to, you know, if you have a cool trampoline in your backyard and I just went back there and went in there, you would think I was trespassing. And that's the same thing because these are tribal lands that really we could keep open to only tribal people because we own them. However, we don't. Like one of our biggest, um, biggest values is generosity and hosting. And we love hosting people. And I think that part of that is, you know, expecting people, we expect that people know how to be good guests. Mm -hmm. And that is not always the case. Yeah. Robin, I'd like to maybe expand on that is, you know, because once we opened that park, we did open it, it was vandalized already, you know. Um, and so, these are just some of the things that, um, you know, that we were up against. You know, I know we, we talked about one of our housing developments that we were wanting to build. And there was an association, you know, that sued the tribe, you know, saying that, you know, it wasn't tribal land and, um, we you know, um, right, you know. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, um, you know, we won the, the lawsuit and, and therefore, they they named the road we won. Um, so um, you know, but it, it's just these battles that we're having, even within you know uh, the exterior boundaries of the reservation. So you know, right. And I think that people don't know how to be good guests, and they often have ideas on the ways that we should do things, not knowing that we've planned for this land to come back to us for so long. Um, but the other part that's been happening for about the last 10 years is um, uh, gentrification here in Suquamish, where suddenly because we've made these improvements, because we have, we've had the funding to be able to make these, uh, these improvements, we have tribal members being priced out of purchasing homes here in Suquamish and definitely in Indianola. And it's, it's, been really difficult to manage. And so the tribe has been working a lot, especially during the pandemic and using some COVID funds to increase home ownership by tribal members here in Suquamish. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always this piece of, you know, there's racism about how they expect us to make the situation worse. Um, and then it's like, oh no, wait, actually they did a really good job. I want a piece of that too. So um, those parts have been really stressful. Um, next slide, please. And we know we showed photos of um, Chief Seattle's grave um, back there during Jamie's presentation. And um, 
when um, we had Chief Seattle's grave, it, it looks like this was 2001. I can't believe that was 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there um, you know, was definitely a hate crime that went on there, definitely related to that group Jay was talking about, which I think yeah. was called like a Portma or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was a bunch of um, property, white property owners in Suquamish who um, were upset that we were building a housing development on a piece of property that was available for anybody to purchase. We just happened to be the ones who came up with the money and they didn't like the idea of affordable housing right there. Yeah. And, and I have, uh, uh, just, yeah, and I have another experience um, that I had, you know, what some probably almost 15 years ago when I went to fish on the shores of Suquamish um, and laying out my little gill net and um, having the property owner come out and say, you know, you blankety blank Indian, get that blankety blank net off my beach and called me every name in the book. And, and I thought, oh my God, you know, I mean, this is, this is like unreal. I never, I never really had to experience that. I experienced it. My fear was that, you know, my kids, and even my grandkids would experience that. And, you know, I'm here to tell you that about three weeks ago, they had the same experience, maybe not as much as the name calling, but they were told to get the net off the beach. And, um, and, and even, you know, this is somewhat 25 years, you know, uh, three generations of, of experience. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really relevant story, Jay. Uh, mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Because we're talking about um, violence against our sacred spaces, but also we're talking about violence against our people too. During that, Jay's um, son and grandkids experienced that um, just three weeks ago being verbally assaulted there on the beach. And that translates into different things like police violence. And um, I think most people are aware of um, Stone Child Chief Sticks' um, death at the hands of a um, Paulsbo police officer in the middle of a very busy family uh, um, event that was going on there. And people think that maybe that was our first time like really dealing with that. But um, sadly, back in 2015, um, we lost um, a tribal member, uh, Daniel. Uh, I always mess up his last name and it bothers me that I do that. So I'm going to try to be very intentional about it. Um, David, uh, Kovoraballis, oh, I said that wrong anyway, um, but it was one of my, I was a new council uh, woman at that point, and it was my first time really feeling like I've lost one of my tribal members. I don't, I don't know him personally, but this one like, you know, hurts my heart. It hurts my heart in so many ways that I wasn't expecting because he is a part of um, our tribe his family, his mom and his sister were trying to get him mental health counseling at, um, or get him checked in down in Tacoma. And he was turned away because they didn't think that he was severe enough to need to be brought in. And he ended up running off to a lumber yard and was talking to himself, walking through the lumber yard and people called the police on him and they found him inside um, some of the lumber hiding and he had his cell phone and he was trying to call somebody and um, they saw that as a gun and shot him while he was trying to access services. Um, so these are things that every time these happen, we feel them collectively as a community. And, um, and then we're reminded that anytime this gets posted, um, and if you can move to the next slide, that would be great. Um, anytime anything gets talked about within the tribe, there are always people that say incredibly racist comments on there. And we always try to tell our, each other, don't read the comments, don't read the comments because they're so bad. And so we're really looking for different ways like for people to be an ally. And I do appreciate my friends that get on there who constantly combat that narrative about the tribe being bad, the tribe getting things for free. And um, because we've overcome so much. And so to, to make these strides and to make this, to offer all of these wonderful things, we're doing that through a lot of trauma. Our resilience is built in there. Our humor is built in there. Our caringness and ability to host is really wonderful. Even through things like missing and murdered indigenous women, 
who, you know, has been a part of our lives forever. You know, if a girl goes missing, it's seen as, well, maybe she's just run away. And it's like, no, her mom knows that she's missing. She knows what the difference is. And these are collective sorrows and very personal family sorrows that we go through. Um, but I, I want to end and I want to lead into um, Jamie's um, next piece, which is when I got on here, I said that um, when I first started working for the tribe 23 years ago, um, the tribe had lowered the age of an elder to 55 because people weren't living long enough to reach 65. And it is such an honor to have been here at the tribe to watch the process of our population of elders grow and grow. And now they have a joke where they say, they call them baby elders between 55 and 65, and they're in great health and they're doing really well. And, you know, they're having, um, they have really good jobs and they get to take care of their grandkids and go and volunteer in different, different arenas. And, you know, that has come a lot of times. I don't think people, they think that, you know, we're just trying to make all this money. Um, I'm not sure what they think we're putting it into since we're pretty transparent about what we're putting it into. But the truth is we're putting it into our tribe. We're putting it into the community. And that community involves you. It involves the non-native people that are here. Our clinic will be open for people who are Medicaid eligible. Um, we have lots of services that we just provide to people. So our way of life definitely continues. And with that, I'm gonna send that over to Jamie. Next slide, please. I actually think this was going to be Mr. Mills's slide, but um, as Robin said, I mean, he could speak to a lot of these photos and these pictures uh, because he's been there uh, for all of this. Um, he, you know, I can talk about it, Jamie. Um, you know, um, I remember, you know, after the right, um, them pitching the fish. This was down in Chico, and that is Tom Cadero's boat. And this is Tom right in the center, um, cooking salmon. Um, and then this is um, Jefferson um, fishing for crab. Um, and then the, the the picture from the museum is them drying salmon, um, which is something. I uh, was taught how to do, and, and I'm currently teaching um, our CKA students um, um, how to do as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, just today I was up at their campus and they're building a new smoke uh, smokehouse. And so they wanted some advice on, on uh, how to do this and how to do that. And so um, I'm so excited that, um, you know, I did it a number of years ago um, with the school and um, we went out and caught the fish um, we processed it and got it ready for the smoker and and then the kids tended the fires and kept it going and and they were able to can some of it and distribute it to the elders and um, they were able to keep some of it and, and enjoyed it um, for themselves and um, so I'm, I'm just so happy to be a part of the program um, you know the um, the kids really seem to enjoy it um, and again I, I look back and it's been almost 50 years um, that I've been doing it. And, um, you know, it, it's funny because I'm, um, I kind of look at myself and, you know, I'm the elder now um, <laughs> teaching these kids, you know, I was always the young kid running around, you know, um, getting into trouble, but, um, but yeah, so this is um, definitely, um, you know, uh, still, you know, the, uh, the ways of life for us. So smoking and canning season. Yeah, And it also used to be, you know, this time of year was the way that my family could have money to buy school clothes when yeah. my dad would go out and fish. And mm -hmm. uh, I used to go to school all the time with all my clothes smelling like, like smoked salmon. Yeah. And <laughs> Sorry. Now, when I go around with everybody smelling smoked salmon, they want me to share it with them. So yeah. um, it is canning. It, it is canning season for us here. Mm -hmm. Next slide. I just want to say we are we're having so much fun talking about it and there's so heavy such heavy issues but we're running out of time so we're going to be sorry if we don't get to your questions tried to answer a couple in the chat yeah all right i guess next slide 
Um, some of the priorities for the tribe, um, as we've talked about, you know, we're going to continue on with um, health and wellness, affordable housing, dealing with gentrification, you know, expanding economic development opportunities, because as we've stated, this goes directly into helping our tribe live longer and um, be healthier. Um, and to provide resources so we're able to do that natural resource protection. Um, and like the education piece, I always like to tell people, you know, when you buy gas on the reservation, we have allocated those, um, the Suquamish sales tax that's on that gas. And that goes directly to our education program to full, because mm -hmm. we do uh, full scholarships to um, colleges. And we have, mm -hmm. I think, 65 um, students in college at this point. Uh, yeah. next slide. I think the other thing, Robin, is was the economic development in, in our government uh, employees. We're trying to, to to really establish a living wage for them, yes. you know. And I know that that's you know um, something that um, we're really working at is is really um, looking at each and every position and ensuring that we can we can you know pay the them a, a living wage. Yeah, we we adopted a fourteen dollar minimum wage a number of years ago, and now we're right. like we need to increase that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and right. we recognize the cost of inflation as, you know, I'm sure Kitsap County is also aware of those impacts and and we will work to analyze that data and come forward with a with a solution for our families so that 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 we can live and thrive here in our community. Right. Next slide, please. And there's our tribal council. We're all a little tired after two days on a Zoom meeting, but it was a great is great day. <laughs> Um, next slide, because I keep seeing questions about this, of how you can support the Suquamish resurgence. And here's mm -hmm. a couple of things that you can do, understanding the roles and really talking about, you know, when someone's like, oh, the tribe gets all of that for free. I can guarantee you we are not getting anything for free. Everything comes from a lot of hard work and, um, you know, supporting those habitat recovery you know, being mm -hmm. an ally, learning different ways to do that. And mm -hmm. you know, we've got like seven minutes left. So I think okay. if there, if the moderators want to take it, we'll just keep talking if you don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> the moderators are very reluctant to jump in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can, uh, it, went, it went over, but the, the information was just so valuable, so valuable. Let's jump in. Azura, are you there? I am here. Uh, would you like to take a question or two, or should we take a question? I defer to you. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll take a quick question. Um, and there are some great questions here. Some have been answered already, and some we'll try to get to. Um, let's see. This one from Lori Cadet. How can non-tribal members of the community partner with you to achieve your goals as well as establish trust so we may work together as a true community? Excellent. And that can go to any of you. Robin, you want to? <laughs> oh, uh, Lori. Lori is a great partner already and a really great ally. So I feel like um, it would be great if some of our allies answered some of these questions because, you know, she reaches out when she has questions, when groups that she's a part of, when they have questions, they come to one of us and ask those questions. They call our front desk, they go to, we have a very extensive website that we worked really hard to make sure that information was all on there for people. Um, and I think showing up, I mean, you know, showing up to help volunteer, showing up um, in different ways you can. It's harder right now, but um, yeah, and just learning you can't, learning as much as you can. You know, you could share these videos afterwards with a group that you're a part of. If you're part of a community group, a church group, anything like that, these are available to watch. So you can have these discussions and help educate your friends and family on these issues. And I would say that would be one of the biggest things that you could do to help. I think it also means learning about our culture. So visit our Suquamish Museum, participate in our cultural events, you know, participate and, and be a partner with us and really be a champion for the tribe. Thank you for that. Okay. My turn. Yep. 
So in the chat, or not the chat, the questions and answer, there's a question that I have a note about. I wanted, one of the highlights of my night was, was Kate's song. And she talked about song catchers. And she talked about uh, medicine. I, I had no idea this was all new, new information, wonderful information. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions in the chat, can you explain what a song catcher is, someone? I can help answer that. So I was taught um, by my mother and other cultural bearers from not just only our tribe, but other tribes as well. And one of the things I mentioned before was that songs are alive and they travel around. And there's a lot of people who will go out and sit in a spot or someone who is maybe open to those things that are there or is, their spirit is called to it they will catch songs. That's how my term is, there's called song catchers. A lot of people use um, like um, a composer. They have composed this song. Um, mm -hmm. They're the maker of this song. Um, those are just my teachings. And I know a lot of other people have these same teachings as well. Thank you, Kate. That was a wonderful song. Thank you, Kate. So another question that we had, um, from Francis Malone was, if you had to choose one current issue that is of most concern to the tribe, what do you think it would be? I think that's a loaded question, right? <laughs> I mean, I want to say historical trauma and those impacts. I want to say tokenism. I want to say um, the threat to our resources. I mean, it's probably different for everyone, but those would be the top three in my mind. Thank you. That was a, that is a hard question. I don't know if coming from my point of view, it's preserving those treaty rights. <laughs> Climate change in general. Climate right? change in general, yeah. Threats to our tribal sovereignty. Jay not being able to wear a very nice stylish jacket <laughs> or vest to something when other people get to wear Make America Great Again hats right. or anything, and they would be appalled if someone asked them to stop wearing it. It was a beautiful vest, too. I mean, you know. Oh. And I think people don't realize that when we wear, you know, like I'm wearing some dentillion shell earrings, we don't, this is what, this is just us. We don't, we just put it on. We don't, you know, and, and it is what it is. It's our way of life. Um, yeah, it's people, very painful. Like, I yeah, remember, really, you know, I got up at like five o'clock in the morning to get dressed up and then get in line because I wanted to be sure, you know, I don't know if people realize the process of how you get in the, the courtroom. Um, you have to get in line early in the morning you know, to, and wait to get a, a little car or ticket. You know, I, my ticket was number the 31st person in line. Uh, and again, I was really, really honored and proud to be there and then just to be belittled. Um, you know, um, I, I didn't think about much about it then, but, you know, thinking about it now, it's, you know, whose decision was that? I mean, if, if this is the highest court in the nation and, you know, they're supposed to be impartial, it shouldn't matter what I wear, mm -hmm. you know, in that courtroom, you know, um, you know, I do understand. I think there was a, a chief from the Yakima tribe that was in full regalia. And uh, of course, he wasn't allowed to, to get in the courtroom as well either. So, but yeah, this is just a, a couple of years ago. So, Azura, I could we could I could ask the question or <clears throat> wait from our um, our leaders to tell us we should uh, start closing down. I'm I'm there are so many questions. I hope we had a lot of people in the chat to answer these questions. And my understanding sure. is that Sarah is and um, the people who are coordinating this are doing are keeping all those questions. So hopefully we can answer them at a future date. But I mm -hmm. think that it's really important to let uh, Kate sing us out and end us in a yep. good way. And so I would defer to her and let her let her sing. OK. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm actually going to be singing the Suquamish uh, thank you song. This was um, composed or caught by Peg and um, Zeke. Um, this was actually made to thank one of our community members um, a, a long time ago. Dagui <clears throat>
weeds. Dag weed ti haf de booth twal tad zo up sheets. Dag weed ti haf de booth twal tad zo up sheets. Dag weed ti haf de booth twal Should we wrap up at this point or are we wrapped up? Um, there. I just want to say thank you to our panelists tonight. I appreciate your time and your um, your stories, even though I grew up with you guys. Every time I get with you, I learn something new. Um, I and so I thank you for that, um, opening up those discussions. Um, and for our participants, there is a short um, survey that we would really appreciate your feedback. And um, the Earl will be in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Azura. For, this is, uh, you've been a wonderful, Co-moderator, I think it's what we're called. And it's been an exciting evening for me just to learn a lot more. And I hope everybody learned something this evening. I learned a couple of things that if I could just share those very briefly. Uh, one, uh, Jamie, every time your dad was talking, you were shaking your head admirably and you were so very proud. That was a, a big thing for me tonight. Robin, um, uh, I, I, um, the family separations in the boarding schools was, was uh, it was a very powerful and, and moving discussion. Uh, family, 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 family. And Jay, uh, I would just say, uh, having been involved with the, the fisheries and treaties all during the 80s and 90s in the State Department of Washington, DC, uh, I didn't believe climate change was real then. I believe it's real now. It's happening, it's happening in our world, not just acidification, but everything, uh, salmon and, uh, uh, that was, that was also very powerful. And uh, I, I think I will just say thank you to everyone. And next session is uh, November 4th at 6.30. Uh, it'll be a special session. It's uh, the final session facilitated by the Dispute Resolution Center uh, and, and the tribe and structured as a healing circle on November 4th at 6.30. Um, it's been a wonderful evening. I won't uh, go on any farther because we're we're running out of time. But thank you for your time and attention, and uh, uh, thank you for the experience that I had tonight. And I hope we all had. Thank you, Ed, Azure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Edie, Jamie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Such a pleasure. <laughs>